Hey folks, before the video starts, please leave a like and subscribe to cheer me up. Make sure you are relaxed and enjoy today's stories. The dark web led me to a lost alien colony in Antarctica. The government doesn't want the truth to get out. I've always been one of those people who get caught up in late night internet rabbit holes. You know the type. One minute you're watching a 10 minute video about how to cook the perfect steak. And the next, you're knee deep in some conspiracy about ancient civilizations. It's a dangerous habit, but honestly, I've never been one to stop myself. If it's 3 a.m. and there's weird content out there, I'm probably watching it. A couple of weeks ago, I was on Reddit, just browsing the usual subs like Archrosh Conspiracy and RR Unresolved Mysteries when someone in the comments mentioned the real deep web. Not the shady stuff you hear about like drugs and hitmen for hire, but the real deep web. The kind of stuff that apparently holds secrets no one wants you to know. I had heard all of this before, but my curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to see for myself what was out there. Now, I'm not a complete idiot. I know enough to use a VPN. I understand that Tor exists for a reason. And yeah, I've read all the warnings about what kind of garbage you can run into. But that night, something felt different. I wasn't looking for a cheap thrill or some creepy pasta nonsense. I wanted to find something real. So I decided to dive in. It took me a while to figure out the right forms, the right links, but eventually I found a small unassuming website with the header, eyes only. No flashy graphics or bizarre design choices, just plain black text on a white background. There was a simple message in the center of the screen. Everything you've been told about the world is a lie. Okay, sure. Sounds cliche, right? But something about it made me stop. I guess it was because the page didn't have the usual edgy feel of some deep web conspiracy site. There was no ominous music playing in the background, no creepy images of skulls or cryptic symbols. It was just basic. There were a few hyperlinks underneath the message. The first one caught my eye. Antarctica, the forbidden zone. I clicked it. At first the site loaded slowly, like it was coming from some ancient server. When it finally opened, I was met with a series of black and white photos, grainy as hell, but still clear enough to make out. There were images of snow-covered landscapes, strange rock formations, and what looked like old military bases. They weren't labeled, just dumped in a grid. What really made me pause were the photos of giant metallic structures buried halfway in the ice. They looked too smooth, too perfect to be natural. The scale was impossible to tell, but something about them felt wrong, like they didn't belong in this world. There was a text box below the images and it was written like a personal journal. I remember it word for word because honestly, it gave me chills. It said, they didn't want me to find this. The Antarctic Treaty isn't about protecting wildlife. It's about keeping us out. What I've seen down here is not human. It's not of this earth and they know it. I'll be uploading what I can before they find me. I think they're already tracking me. I don't know why, but that last sentence stuck with me. Maybe it was the paranoia of the deep web getting to me, but I swore I heard a creak in my apartment right when I read it. I looked around, but there was nothing. Just the usual creaks of an old building. Anyway, I should have closed the site then. Maybe get some sleep, wake up and laugh it off the next morning. But you know how these things go. I was hooked. I clicked through more photos, more journal entries, all with the same tone. 
whoever wrote this was terrified but determined. They were claiming that they had found some ancient abandoned structures deep beneath the Antarctic ice. Alien, obviously, because why else would the government keep it so locked down? But it didn't end there. One photo looked different from the rest. It was blurry and looked like it was taken in a hurry. In the foreground, there was a dark figure standing in front of one of those metallic structures. It wasn't human. I can't explain it, but its shape was wrong. Long limbs, a stretched torso, and its head. Well, it wasn't shaped like any head I've ever seen. The journal entry beneath the photo was even more unnerving. I saw one of them today. They've been watching me. I thought they were dead, that the cold had killed them off. But they're still here, watching, waiting. I have to get out of here before it's too late. Okay, this was where I almost noped out. Almost. But then I thought, it's just some creep on the internet trying to scare people. It's the deep web. What else do you expect? But then, I got an email. Right as I was scrolling through the last journal entry, my Gmail pinged, and I figured it was spam. But when I opened my inbox, there was no subject line, no sender info, just a blank email with a single file attached. The file was titled Antarctica Coordinates dot PDF. I stared at it for a long time, my heart racing. I hadn't given anyone my email. I was on a VPN. Tor was running. There was no way anyone should have been able to contact me. I hesitated, but something in me needed to know. So I opened it. The file was exactly what it said. Coordinates. But not just any coordinates. They were way down in Antarctica. Way past any research stations. Way past anything remotely reachable by a normal expedition. Just the middle of nowhere. I stared at the numbers, and for some reason, they didn't feel random. Like someone was expecting me to go. At that point, I should have shut my laptop and gone to bed, but I couldn't. My curiosity had turned into something else. A need to know what the hell was going on. So, yeah. I booked a flight. I'm sitting in a small hostel in Argentina now just waiting for the next part of my journey. From here, I'm hopping on a boat that's headed to the frozen south. I'm not sure what I'll find there, or if I'll even make it back to tell anyone about it. But if this post gets published, it means I'm still alive. For now, the flight from Argentina was brutal. I thought I was prepared for it, but Antarctica isn't the kind of place you can really get ready for no matter how many YouTube videos or survival guides you watch. The cold cuts through everything. Your clothes, your skin, even your thoughts. It was relentless. I wasn't on some fancy, well-funded expedition either. This was a skeleton crew, people who didn't ask too many questions. You'd be surprised how easy it is to find someone willing to take you into the unknown if you've got enough cash and keep your story vague enough. I told them I was doing research on ancient structures, which technically wasn't a lie. They didn't pry. I guess they'd heard crazier stories before. When we finally landed on the ice, the isolation hit me hard. There's no sound out there, no life, just endless white. The kind of silence that makes you feel like you're the only person left on earth. I remember standing outside, staring into the frozen expanse and feeling like I was being watched. Not by the crew, not by animals, just something. It's hard to explain, but it was like the whole place had eyes, hidden somewhere deep below the ice, waiting for me to take the wrong step. The coordinates from the file were burned into my brain at this point. The crew didn't need to know exactly where I was headed. They thought I'd be with them the whole time. 
but I had other plans. I wasn't sticking around the research station they were headed for. There was something I had to see for myself, even if it meant going off alone. And that's exactly what I did. I waited until the second night. The sun never really sets down there, but the crew was exhausted from the trip, and most of them had passed out early. I grabbed my gear, some basic supplies, and set out. I remember feeling the cold creep into my bones almost immediately, but I kept moving. I had no choice. I'd programmed the coordinates into my GPS, but the thing kept glitching out, probably from the extreme temperatures. I had to rely on it though. I wasn't exactly in a place you could navigate by landmarks, just miles of ice in every direction. After what felt like hours of trudging through the snow, I saw it. At first, I thought my mind was playing tricks on me, but no, it was real. A massive, jagged crack in the ice, like a wound in the earth. It was hidden in a valley, almost impossible to see unless you were right on top of it. And inside that crack, partially buried in snow, was the first sign of what I had come for. A metal surface. It wasn't just any metal though. This thing was smooth, unnaturally so. No rust, no wear from the elements. It was like the ice had preserved it perfectly. I pulled off my glove and touched it, and the metal was warm, warm, like it had its own heat source. That's when I realized that whatever this thing was, it wasn't from here. Not from this time, maybe not even from this planet. But before I could process what I was looking at, I heard it, a sound, a low, humming vibration, almost like an engine coming from deep below the ice. My first instinct was to run, but my feet wouldn't move. The humming got louder, and I swear, the metal beneath my hand started to pulse in sync with it, like it was alive. I don't know how long I stood there, frozen in place, but the sound faded as quickly as it had started. I backed away slowly trying to make sense of what had just happened. I wanted to leave, head back to the crew, maybe pretend I hadn't seen anything, but I couldn't. I hadn't come this far to turn back now. I decided to follow the crack deeper into the valley. As I descended, I saw more of the metal structures emerging from the ice. Walls, columns, shapes I couldn't identify. Some of them were massive, stretching high above me, disappearing into the snowstorms that constantly swirled overhead. Others were buried almost completely, like they'd been here for centuries, maybe longer. And then I found the entrance. It was a perfectly circular hole in the ice, lined with the same smooth metal. It looked like a tunnel, and I knew, somehow, I knew this was where the coordinates were leading me. I hesitated for a long time at the edge, staring into the blackness beyond. But eventually, curiosity won out. I took out my flashlight, took a deep breath, and stepped inside. The tunnel sloped downwards at a gentle angle, the walls almost seamless, except for the occasional strange symbol carved into the metal. The air was thick with moisture, warmer than it had any right to be this far beneath the ice. My flashlight flickered a few times, but it held steady enough for me to keep going. I don't know how far I walked, but it felt like miles. Finally, I reached what could only be described as a chamber. It was massive, easily the size of a football field, with strange, organic-looking machines lining the walls. In the center of the room was something that sent a wave of nausea through my entire body. A figure. It stood tall, much taller than any human, with limbs too long and too thin, its head tilted unnaturally. Its skin was dark and slick, like it was coated in some kind of liquid. It wasn't moving, but it wasn't dead either. I could tell. 
It was just... waiting. I felt that same hum from before vibrating through the floor. My head started pounding, the pressure unbearable. I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. Whatever this place was, whatever they were, it was never meant for human eyes. I turned to leave, but as I did, I heard a voice. Not a human voice, but something cold and mechanical, echoing in my mind rather than my ears. You are not alone. I ran. I didn't look back. I don't remember how I made it out of that tunnel, or how long it took, but by the time I crawled back onto the ice, I was shaking uncontrollably. The wind howled around me, but all I could hear was that voice repeating in my head, over and over, you are not alone. When I finally made it back to the cruise camp, no one noticed I'd been gone. They were too busy with their own work, oblivious to what I had found. I wanted to tell them, but I couldn't. I didn't know how to explain it, didn't know if they'd even believe me. All I knew was that I had to leave Antarctica, but something else happened that night, something that made me question if I was truly alone out there. When I crawled into my tent and zipped it shut, I found a note. It was folded neatly on my sleeping bag, the paper stained with something dark, almost oily. There were no words, just a symbol, the same one I'd seen carved into the walls of the tunnel. I should have felt terrified, but all I felt was watched, like whatever was down there, whatever I had seen had followed me back, and I wasn't sure if I'd ever be able to escape it. I barely slept that night. Every sound, the wind rattling the tent, the shifting ice beneath me, had me wide awake, heart pounding. I kept telling myself it was just paranoia, that whatever I'd seen was buried miles beneath the ice, trapped in that godforsaken place. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone anymore. The next morning, the crew was getting ready for another trek, but I had no intention of staying. I told them I wasn't feeling well, that I'd caught a bug and needed to head back to civilization. They didn't argue. Most of them didn't care. People come and go in places like this, and no one asks too many questions. I got on the first helicopter out, heading to the nearest supply station. My mind was a blur the whole ride, staring out at the endless white below, wondering if I was leaving something behind, or if something was coming with me. When I reached the station, I thought I'd feel relieved. It was a small outpost, nothing more than a few buildings huddled together against the cold, but it felt like safety. I planned to catch a cargo plane back to Argentina the next day, get as far away from Antarctica as possible. But that night, something happened that made me realize I wasn't leaving anything behind. I was sitting in my bunk, trying to distract myself by watching old YouTube videos I downloaded before the trip. Anything to keep my mind off the creeping dread that had been following me. The station was quiet. Most of the crew asleep or busy with their own work. That's when I heard it. The hum. That same low, vibrating hum I'd heard beneath the ice. Faint but unmistakable. My stomach dropped. I knew what it was. I knew it wasn't a coincidence. I jumped out of bed and grabbed my flashlight, scanning the room like some kind of idiot, even though I knew there was nothing to see. I opened the door and stepped out into the hallway. It was dark. The station powered down to conserve energy for the night, but the hum was getting louder, echoing through the walls. At the end of the hallway was a door leading to a storage room. It was slightly ajar. The station was locked up tight every night, so no one should have been in there. The rational part of me screamed to turn around, go back to bed, ignore it. But the other part, the part that led me down this path in the first place, 
kept pushing me forward. I crept toward the door, my flashlight shaking in my hand. When I reached it, I nudged it open the rest of the way with my foot. The hum stopped. The room was empty, just boxes and equipment piled up like you'd expect in a storage room. But in the far corner, behind a stack of crates, something caught my eye. A piece of paper. I walked over to it, heart hammering in my chest. It wasn't folded this time, just lying there, as if someone had left it for me to find. The symbol. Again. The same one from the tunnel. Dark, oily smudges covering the edges of the paper. I swore I could feel heat radiating off it, like it had just been placed there moments before. My head spun, and I stumbled backward, knocking over one of the crates. There was nothing inside it but random equipment, yet the sound it made echoed in the quiet, like a bomb going off. That's when I heard a different sound, a scraping noise, like something heavy being dragged across the floor. I whipped around, but the room was still empty. At least, it looked empty. I ran. I don't know why or what I thought would happen if I stayed, but my body acted before my brain could process anything. I slammed the door shut behind me and bolted down the hallway to my bunk, locking myself inside. I sat there, shaking, for hours. The paper was still clenched in my hand, and for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how it had ended up in the storage room, or who, what, had put it there. My mind raced with possibilities, none of them good. Had someone from the crew followed me? Had something followed me from the crack in the ice? Or was I losing my grip on reality? I decided then that I was done. Whatever I'd gotten myself into, whatever was down there in Antarctica, it wasn't worth it. I had to leave. Tomorrow, I'd catch the cargo plane and I'd never come back. I'd delete the files, forget about the photos, erase everything. But that night, the nightmare started. I don't dream much, not usually. But when I did finally drift off, it wasn't sleep. It was like my mind was still down there, trapped beneath the ice. I saw the tunnels, stretching out for miles, and the chamber with its alien machines and strange symbols. And in the center, that figure, waiting. Its eyes, if you could call them that, were locked on me, unmoving, but I knew it was aware. I knew it was alive. I tried to wake up, but I couldn't. The hum was back, louder this time, vibrating through my skull. The figure stepped forward, its limbs jerking unnaturally, like a puppet being yanked by invisible strings. Its head tilted again, unnaturally long, dark and slick, dripping with that same oily substance. In the dream, I backed away, but the floor wasn't ice anymore. It was alive. It pulsed beneath my feet, almost like flesh, growing hotter, burning my skin through my boots. I was trapped. I could feel the heat rising, the vibrations getting louder, the air thick with something I couldn't name. Then, the figure spoke. You brought us with you. I woke up gasping for air, drenched in sweat, my heart racing like I'd just run a marathon. I sat up in bed, trying to calm myself, but something felt wrong. The room was too quiet, too still. That's when I saw it. In the corner, just outside the glow of my dying flashlight, was a shadow. Long, thin, impossibly tall. It didn't move. It just stood there, watching me. I froze. I could barely breathe. My mind screamed at me to do something, anything, but all I could do was stare, waiting for it to move. The hum was back, so faint I almost couldn't hear it, but I felt it, vibrating in my chest. I blinked, and it was gone. I sat there for the rest of the night, wide awake, afraid to even close my eyes. I kept telling myself it was a hallucination, a trick of the light, but deep down, I knew the truth. 
When morning came, I packed my things as quickly as I could. The crew was already up, preparing for another day of whatever research they were doing. But I didn't care. I told them I had to leave, that something had come up. They barely even looked at me as I rushed to the helicopter. As we lifted off, I glanced back at the station, half expecting to see that shadow standing outside, watching me leave. But there was nothing, just the empty, frozen wasteland stretching out in all directions. I told myself it was over, that once I was back in civilization, everything would make sense again. But as we flew further from the station, I felt it. That same feeling I'd had when I first stood on the ice. The sensation of being watched, like something was coming with me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever had followed me out of the ice wasn't done yet. But the worst part? That hum. It never really stopped. The cargo plane ride back to Argentina should have been a relief. It wasn't. As the plane's engines hummed around me, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't really leaving Antarctica behind. That place had its claws in me now, and the deeper I sank into my seat, the more I realized there was no running from it. The crew on the plane didn't talk much, mostly engineers and pilots, heading home after a long stint on the ice. But every so often, I caught them glancing at me, just quick sideways looks, like they knew something was off. Maybe it was the way I kept fidgeting, or how I kept checking over my shoulder like something was hiding in the plane's dark corners. Or maybe they could feel it too, the hum. It hadn't stopped, not really. It was faint, barely noticeable above the drone of the engines, but it was there, like background noise in my head, just on the edge of perception. I tried to drown it out, focusing on anything else, but it would creep back in, reminding me that whatever I had touched in that frozen hell wasn't done with me yet. The hours dragged on. I didn't sleep. Couldn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that figure from the chamber, its long distorted limbs, the glistening black skin, its eyes dark and hollow, staring right into me, waiting. When we finally touched down in Argentina, I thought I'd feel better, safer. I practically ran off the plane, desperate to breathe in air that wasn't heavy with dread. But as soon as I stepped out into the sunlight, something felt wrong. The air was thick, humid, and alive with the sounds of a busy airport. People everywhere, ground crews, passengers, the usual chaos. But despite all the noise, all the normalcy, I felt that same sensation I had on the ice, that watched feeling like eyes were tracking my every move, hidden just out of sight. I told myself I was paranoid, that I was still wound up from everything that had happened, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I hadn't really left that chamber behind. Something had followed me. I checked into a small hotel near the airport, trying to keep things low key. My plan was simple, get some sleep, then book the next flight home. I didn't want to think about Antarctica, about the symbols, the strange figures. I just wanted to forget. But of course, nothing ever goes that smoothly. The hotel room was small, dimly lit, and felt claustrophobic. The hum was louder now, like it had followed me through the walls, vibrating through the cheap plaster and thin floors. I turned on the TV, hoping for some background noise to drown it out. It didn't help. Every few minutes, the signal would cut out, replaced by static. At first, I figured it was just crappy service, but the static started to take on a strange pattern. It wasn't random. There was a rhythm to it, a pulse that matched the hum in my head. I got up, pacing the room, trying to ignore it. But then, the TV flickered, and for a split second, I saw something on the screen 
something that wasn't supposed to be there. A symbol, the same one from the tunnels, the oily black mark I'd found on those papers. I froze, staring at the screen as the static flickered again, revealing flashes of that dark figure standing in the middle of a white landscape. Antarctica. It was watching me. I grabbed the remote, turning off the TV, but the image burned into my brain. How was this possible? How was this thing reaching me here, halfway across the world? I sat down on the edge of the bed, my head in my hands, trying to steady my breathing. That's when I heard it, the scratching. At first it was faint, like something brushing against the walls, but it quickly grew louder, more frantic. It was coming from behind the door. I stood up, heart pounding, staring at the door like it might burst open at any second. The scratching intensified, and for a split second, I thought about opening it, about facing whatever was on the other side. But then, the sound stopped. Just stopped. I stood there in the silence, waiting for something to happen. Minutes passed. Nothing. I inched closer to the door, barely breathing, and placed my hand on the doorknob. I turned it, pulling the door open just a crack. The hallway outside was empty. No sign of anyone. No footsteps. No movement. Nothing. But as I stepped out, I noticed something that made my skin crawl. On the floor, right outside my door, was another note. Folded neatly just like the ones before. My stomach lurched as I knelt down and picked it up. I already knew what I would find. The same oily black smudges, the same symbol, and underneath it, scrawled in shaking, uneven handwriting. You can't run from us. I don't remember what I did next. It's all a blur. I think I packed my things, but I couldn't even think straight. I just knew I had to get out of there, out of Argentina, out of anywhere this thing could reach me. I grabbed a taxi to the airport, my pulse racing the whole way. The driver kept giving me weird looks, like he could tell something was wrong. I didn't care. All I wanted was to leave. When I got to the airport, I bought the first ticket I could find. Didn't matter where. I just needed to keep moving. As I sat in the terminal, waiting for the boarding call, I kept my head down, trying to avoid eye contact with anyone. I felt eyes on me though, strangers, glancing at me as they walked by, their gazes lingering a little too long. Every so often, I caught a glimpse of someone looking my way, then quickly turning when I noticed them. It wasn't paranoia. I was being watched. I kept telling myself it was just people being curious, but deep down I knew better. Whatever had attached itself to me, whatever had followed me from the ice, wasn't done with me yet. Then as I sat there, my phone buzzed in my pocket. I pulled it out, hoping for a distraction, maybe a message from someone back home, but there were no texts, no notifications. Just one new email. It was from an address I didn't recognize. No subject line. No preview text. I hesitated, staring at the screen. Part of me wanted to delete it without opening it, but my fingers moved on their own, tapping the message open. There was nothing in the body of the email. Just one attachment. A video file. The file name was a string of random characters but something about it felt familiar, like I'd seen it before. My thumb hovered over the play button for what felt like an eternity before I gave in and pressed it. The video was dark, shaky, like it had been recorded on an old camera. The first few seconds were just static, but then the image stabilized and I recognized what I was looking at. It was the chamber, the same place I had seen beneath the ice. The same place I had been. The camera panned slowly across the room, showing the strange machines lining the walls, 
the symbols etched into the metal. Then it stopped, focusing on something in the center of the chamber. It was me. I was standing there, in the middle of the room, staring up at the dark figure looming over me. My face was pale, my eyes wide with fear. And then, the figure moved. It stepped forward, its long, distorted limbs reaching out toward me, its head tilting to the side in that unnatural way. And as it reached for me, the video cut to black. My phone screen went dark. I sat there, frozen in place, staring at the phone in my hand, my heart racing. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. But one thing was clear. I hadn't left Antarctica. Antarctica had followed me. And now, there was no escape. The plane ride was supposed to take me away from all of this, to get as far from Antarctica as humanly possible. I had no idea what my plan was after landing. Maybe disappear for a while, go off the grid. But as soon as we were in the air, I knew it wasn't going to matter. Something had changed. I could feel it, deep in my gut, like I wasn't just running from something anymore. I was carrying it with me. That low hum had become a constant background noise, no matter how loud the engines roared around me. Every inch of me vibrated with it, like it was crawling beneath my skin. I closed my eyes, hoping I'd drift off, but the second I did, I was plunged right back into the nightmare. This time, it was worse. It wasn't a dream. It was like I was still awake, still on the plane, but the walls around me weren't metal anymore. They were ice. I was back in the chamber, standing there in the cold, and that dark figure was looming over me again. I could feel it breathing, if that's what it was doing. Its presence so heavy, so wrong. It wasn't just an image anymore. It was like I could feel the cold from its body, see the black ooze dripping from its skin, smell the air thick with something metallic, like blood, but sharper. And then it whispered, You were never supposed to find us. I snapped awake, gasping for air, my hands gripping the armrests so hard my knuckles turned white. My heart pounded in my chest, and I looked around trying to ground myself. Passengers were staring, their eyes wide. I must have been making some kind of noise in my sleep, but that wasn't what had them spooked. It was the black stain on my shirt. At first, I thought I'd spilled something, maybe coffee or water, but when I touched it, it wasn't wet. It was thick, sticky, like oil the same oily black substance I'd seen on the notes, in the chamber, on that creature. I rubbed my fingers together, feeling the weight of it, the way it clung to my skin, like it was alive. I rushed to the bathroom, locking the door behind me, frantically wiping at the stain, but it wouldn't come off. The more I scrubbed, the more it spread, seeping through the fabric of my shirt, staining my hands, my arms. I stared at myself in the mirror, and for a second, I didn't recognize the person staring back. The lights in the bathroom flickered. The walls seemed to pulse with that same hum, like the whole plane was vibrating now. My head pounded, the pressure building, like something was pushing from the inside, trying to get out. I leaned against the sink, my breath coming in shallow gasps. I didn't know what to do. How do you fight something you can't even understand? Something that follows you across the world, something that shouldn't exist. That's when I noticed the mirror. It wasn't just my reflection anymore. Behind me, in the fogged up glass, I could see it. The figure, standing in the corner of the tiny bathroom, its head tilted to one side, watching me with those hollow, dark eyes. I didn't turn around. I couldn't. I just stared into the mirror, my chest tightening as it took a step closer. 
Its body was tall, unnaturally tall, limbs bending at impossible angles as it moved. The air in the bathroom grew colder, the hum louder, rattling through my skull. I squeezed my eyes shut, whispering to myself, This isn't real. This isn't real. But when I opened my eyes, it was standing right behind me. Its hand, or what looked like a hand, reached out, inches from my shoulder. The oily substance dripping from its fingertips burned through my clothes, singeing the skin beneath. I felt the cold, like death itself was wrapping around me, pulling me back into the dark. I bolted out of the bathroom, crashing into the narrow aisle of the plane. A flight attendant tried to ask if I was okay, but I shoved past her, heading straight for my seat. The passengers were staring again, whispering, but I didn't care. I just wanted this to stop. I sat down, gripping the armrests, trying to calm my breathing. The hum was louder than ever, vibrating through my entire body. I closed my eyes again, trying to block everything out, but as soon as I did, I heard it. A voice, not in my head this time, but right beside me. You can't run from what you've brought back. My eyes snapped open. The seat next to me, which had been empty when I boarded, wasn't empty anymore. The figure sat there, towering even as it hunched, its twisted limbs barely fitting in the seat, dark liquid pooling at its feet, its head tilted toward me, eyes, if you could call them that, fixed on mine. I couldn't move couldn't scream, couldn't breathe. The figure leaned closer, and I felt the air grow colder, the world around me narrowing to just this moment, just this thing sitting beside me. We're everywhere now, it whispered, voice like ice. And so are you. I bolted out of my seat, knocking over the tray table, shoving past the other passengers. I didn't care where I was going, I just needed to get out. I ran to the back of the plane, my hands shaking, the hum now pounding in my ears like a drum. The flight attendants tried to stop me, asking what was wrong, but I couldn't explain it. How could I? How do you tell someone that you've brought something back from the edge of the world, something that doesn't belong here? I made it to the emergency exit, my hand on the lever, ready to pull it, but then the hum stopped. Everything went silent. The plane, the people, the voices. I turned around, my hand still gripping the lever, and saw every passenger on the plane staring at me. Their eyes, they weren't human anymore. They were dark, hollow pits, just like the figure, and all of them were watching me, their heads tilting in unison, like they were waiting for something. I let go of the lever, stepping back, my heart pounding in my chest. I backed away slowly, feeling the walls of the plane closing in, the air thick and suffocating. Then I heard the voice again, not from the figure, not from the passengers, but from inside me. You brought us back. Now you belong to us. I collapsed into the aisle, the world spinning around me my vision blurring. The hum was back, louder than ever, rattling through my bones. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. Everything went black. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. The doctors told me I had a panic attack on the plane, that I was delusional from exhaustion and dehydration. They said they found me unconscious in the aisle gripping a flight attendant's arm, rambling about shadows and symbols. I didn't argue. What was the point? They wouldn't believe me, and I couldn't explain it, not in any way that made sense. They told me to rest, to take care of myself, but I knew it wouldn't matter, because the hum was still there. Faint, but steady. A reminder that whatever I had uncovered in Antarctica wasn't done with me. I don't know what happens next. 
Maybe I'll keep running, trying to outrun the inevitable. Maybe I'll disappear, vanish like those who came before me. But I can't escape the truth. I brought something back with me. Something that wasn't meant to be found. And now, it's everywhere. I uncovered an alien communication program on the dark web. Now, they're trying to make contact with me. I've always been a tech nerd. You know, one of those guys who thinks they know everything about computers, always looking for the next cool gadget, or trying to find some obscure corner of the internet to poke around in. I guess that's what eventually led me to the dark web. I didn't go there for anything illegal. I'm not that dumb. But I heard about how you could find the strangest, most hidden things. Weird forums, lost knowledge, strange games, stuff you couldn't find anywhere else. So one late Friday night, after I'd had a couple of beers, I decided to take the plunge. I'd read all the precautions, made sure I was using a VPN, downloaded Tor, all the things you're supposed to do to stay safe. I'm sure you've heard stories about people going on the dark web and finding hitmen for hire or creepy videos, but I wasn't interested in that. I just wanted to see what was out there, explore the unknown. I started by browsing some of the more well-known forums, people selling knockoff electronics, data dumps from who knows where, stuff like that. Pretty standard and honestly, a bit boring but then I stumbled across a link with no description, just the title, Project Doorway. It was buried deep on some forgotten message board, tucked between threads about conspiracy theories and fake alien sightings. No one was talking about it, but the name just hooked me. I thought maybe it was some RRG, alternate reality game, or one of those creepy rabbit holes that the internet loves to hide. You know, like that cicada 3301 thing people still talk about. So I clicked the link. It brought me to a plain black page with a single line of text in the middle. Do you want to communicate with them? Them? Who's them? Aliens? Ghosts? I figured it was just some prank, but the site looked so raw, like it hadn't been touched in years, like it was some forgotten piece of the internet that someone left behind. That made it even creepier. There was a yes and no option beneath the question. Naturally, I clicked yes. The screen went black for a second, and I thought maybe it crashed or it was a dead link, but then some strange text started appearing. It wasn't any language I'd ever seen not even like some obscure script or symbols. It was more geometric. It was almost like the text was alive, rearranging itself in patterns that made no sense to me, but I couldn't stop staring at it. I have no idea how long I watched that text, but it was hypnotic. I blinked and realized a new message had appeared under the shifting symbols. It was just a countdown timer, ticking down from 72 hours, no explanation, just 72 hours. That's when I should have bailed, but I didn't. I was too curious. I closed the browser, shrugged it off as some dark web gimmick, and went to bed. The next morning, things started getting weird. The first thing I noticed was a notification on my phone, a message from an unknown number. Now. I know what you're thinking, just some random spam, right? But the message, it didn't make any sense. It was filled with those same geometric symbols I'd seen on the site the night before. I deleted it and laughed it off. I mean, what were the odds that it was connected? Dark web stuff can get into your head, make you paranoid if you're not careful. So I shook it off and went about my day but it didn't stop. 
Throughout the day, I started getting more and more of those messages. Different numbers, same strange symbols. My phone would vibrate every few minutes with new messages, but it wasn't just my phone. When I sat down at my computer later that afternoon to do some work, I saw that the same symbols had somehow been copied into my clipboard. You know, when you right-click something and choose paste, yeah, that. I didn't even copy anything, but when I went to paste a link, all that appeared were those weird alien shapes again. It freaked me out, but I wasn't ready to connect it to Project Doorway yet. I thought maybe my phone or computer had been hacked. I mean, I was on the dark web, right? Could have downloaded something without realizing it. That night, the countdown timer popped back into my head. I wasn't sure why, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. 72 hours. For what? I figured maybe it was just a timer for the page to reset. Or maybe I'd get access to some next part of the puzzle. You know, like one of those internet scavenger hunts. But part of me, part of me felt like something was off. Like something had been set in motion when I clicked. Yes. Something I couldn't undo. It was around 11.30 p.m. when I noticed something strange with my router. The light started flickering rapidly, like it was struggling to maintain a connection. I've got decent internet, so it wasn't normal. I logged into the router to see what was going on. That's when I saw it. A new device had connected to my network. The name of the device was just a string of those same symbols I'd been seeing all day. My stomach dropped. I disconnected the device immediately, but the lights on the router kept flickering, faster now, almost like it was panicking. And then my phone rang. I don't know why I answered it. It was another unknown number, but something compelled me to pick up. At first, all I could hear was static, but then a voice, if you can call it a voice, started whispering. It didn't sound human. It was mechanical, broken, like a distorted recording that had been played a thousand times. And I swear, underneath the distortion, I heard those symbols, not as words, but as sounds. I hung up immediately, heart pounding. I turned off my phone, unplugged my router, and sat there in the dark, trying to calm down. I didn't sleep that night. By the time the sun came up, I had one thought running through my head. I had made a terrible mistake. The next day, I woke up groggy, my head pounding like I'd been on a bender the night before, even though I hadn't had a drop to drink. I barely slept, and every time I closed my eyes, I swear, I could see those symbols. The strange shapes twisted and floated behind my eyelids, almost like they were burned into my brain. I wanted to brush it off, tell myself it was just the lack of sleep and too much screen time. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right. Still, I tried to shake it. People freak themselves out over nothing all the time. It was probably just some creepy trick that got into my head. But then I remembered the countdown. I checked the time. 62 hours left. I hadn't told anyone about this yet, mostly because I didn't want to sound like a paranoid idiot. But I decided to text my buddy Mark. He's into weird internet stuff too so I figured maybe he'd get a kick out of the story. Plus, I thought that if I talked to someone about it, maybe it would lose some of its power, you know? Like, once you say it out loud, it doesn't seem as creepy. Dude, I think I broke my brain last night, I typed, keeping it casual. I didn't get a response for a couple of hours, which wasn't super unusual. Mark's not glued to his phone like I am. So I went about my day, trying to ignore the strange sensation that I was being watched. It's hard to explain, but every time I turned my head, 
I felt like something was just out of my peripheral vision, lurking right on the edge of my awareness. And then it started happening again. My phone, silent all morning, buzzed with another notification, another text, the same strange symbols. This time though, the message was longer, much longer. It stretched across my entire screen in a continuous stream of the weird geometric patterns. My heart was pounding as I stared at it, unsure what to do. I tried blocking the number, but even after blocking it, the same message appeared again. Same symbols, different number. I threw my phone onto the couch, trying to put some distance between me and whatever was happening. I even thought about doing a factory reset, just to wipe everything and start fresh. But before I could do anything, my phone buzzed again. I picked it up, dreading what I was about to see. But this time, it wasn't a string of symbols. It was from Mark. Except, his message didn't make sense either. It just said, They're coming. I felt a cold wave of dread wash over me. I tried to call him immediately, but it went straight to voicemail. I shot off a dozen texts asking if he was messing with me, telling him to stop, if this was some kind of joke. No reply. The countdown was in the back of my mind, ticking down relentlessly. I still didn't know what it was counting down to, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I didn't want to find out. There was something about those symbols, the messages, and the way Mark suddenly went silent that set off alarms in my head. It wasn't just a prank. Something was happening, and it was getting worse. By the time night fell, I was fully on edge. I hadn't heard back from Mark. I hadn't even received any more of those weird messages, which almost made things worse. The silence felt heavy, like the air itself was waiting for something to happen. I locked my doors, even checked the windows twice. Paranoia had completely taken over. Every little noise in my apartment made me jump. I kept hearing faint static, like an old radio picking up a distant signal. I couldn't tell if it was in my head or if it was real, but it was constant. I tried distracting myself, playing some music, watching stupid YouTube videos, anything to drown out the anxiety, but nothing worked. Eventually, I caved and opened my laptop. I had to know more about Project Doorway, but the link was gone. I searched every forum I had visited the night before, tried going through my browser history, even searched the URL manually. Nothing. It was like it never existed, but that didn't make sense. I wasn't imagining it. I couldn't be. I had proof in my phone in the weird messages, and in the unsettling feeling that was gnawing at me. So, I did what anyone would do in a situation like this. I went deeper. I started looking up keywords, alien communication, strange symbols, countdowns. You'd think the internet would be full of results, right? I mean, with all the conspiracy nuts out there, there had to be something but nothing I found matched what I was experiencing. The symbols weren't any known language or cipher. The countdowns led to dead ends. It wasn't until I stumbled across an obscure Reddit thread buried in a deep conspiracy form that I found something that felt close. It was titled, The Door Opens When the Countdown Ends. The post was old, from about seven years ago, and barely had any upvotes. But the more I read, the more my skin started crawling. The user claimed they had found a hidden program on the dark web, something called Project Doorway, that was designed to initiate contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. They said that after clicking a prompt to communicate, their devices started acting strange, receiving weird messages and experiencing technical glitches. The post went on to describe a countdown, 
one that started at 72 hours. The user claimed that as the countdown got closer to zero, they started hearing things, seeing things, things that didn't belong. The last comment from the user simply said, I can't close the door, they're here. I scrolled to the bottom of the thread to see if there were any follow-up posts, but there was nothing. The user hadn't been active on Reddit since that post. That's when my laptop screen flickered, just for a second, but it was enough to make my heart skip a beat. I stared at the screen, waiting for it to happen again, and then it did. The screen went black, then flickered back on, and there it was, another message, written in those same symbols, flashing across my desktop. I didn't even know how it got there. The window wasn't from any program I had opened. It just appeared. I slammed the laptop shut. The static was louder now, almost deafening. It wasn't just in my head. I could hear it coming from my speakers, filling the room with that awful buzzing sound. My phone buzzed again, and my stomach turned as I checked it. Mark. I warned you. They're inside. I didn't move for a while after Mark's text came through. My hands were shaking, and I just sat there staring at my phone, waiting for it to buzz again. My apartment felt suffocating, like the air had thickened with that constant oppressive static. It was everywhere now, coming from my laptop, my phone, even the old TV I had sitting in the corner of the room. No picture, no channels, just static hissing through every speaker. I didn't dare turn any of them off. I know that sounds insane. Why wouldn't I just unplug everything, right? But there was something about the noise, something that made me feel like if I cut it off, I'd lose the only warning I had left. Like it was a signal, some kind of barrier between me and whatever was trying to come through. I grabbed my phone and tried calling Mark again, but it went straight to voicemail, just like before. His last message kept flashing in my head. They're inside. Inside what? My apartment? My devices? My head? That's when I heard it. Not the static. Something else. A faint whisper, buried beneath the noise, like someone was trying to speak but couldn't quite form words. It was soft. Almost a hum at first, but then it grew louder, more distinct. The more I listened, the more I realized it wasn't one voice, it was many. And they were all whispering at once, in that same twisted, broken language from the messages. I pressed my ear against the wall, trying to figure out where it was coming from. Maybe it was my neighbors. Maybe I was just freaking myself out hearing things that weren't there. But as I listened, I realized the sound wasn't coming from the walls or the speakers. It was coming from inside my head. Panic shot through me like ice water, and I stumbled back from the wall, trying to shake it off. This was too much. The messages, the static, the whispers. It was like my mind was unraveling. I hadn't slept. I hadn't eaten, and it felt like something was burrowing deeper into my brain with every second that ticked down. I checked the timer again. 48 hours left. The whispers got louder the closer I looked at the countdown, like they knew I was watching. I couldn't tell if they were trying to warn me or lure me in, but the more I listened, the more the static started to take shape forming words in my own language. Open the door. It was a command, clear, direct, and pulsing in rhythm with the static. My laptop suddenly flared to life, the screen flickering back on by itself. I didn't even touch it. The desktop was blank except for one window that opened on its own. The black screen returned, just like the night I first clicked on Project Doorway and the same question flashed in front of me. Do you want to communicate with them? The yes and no buttons were there again, but this time 
The note button was grayed out, unclickable. I was being forced to make the same choice, only this time there was no way to say no. I slammed the laptop shut again. I wasn't going to give in, but the voices, the static, the whispers, it all got louder, more insistent. It was like the countdown was driving them mad, like they were desperate to come through before time ran out. I grabbed my car keys. I couldn't stay here. My apartment felt like a trap, every electronic device a window, for them to watch me, to speak to me, to break me down. I thought maybe if I'd just left, if I got far enough away, the noise would stop. I didn't care where I was going. I just needed to move. I threw on a hoodie, stuffed my phone into my pocket, still buzzing with new messages, and bolted out the door. The second I stepped outside, the static disappeared. I froze on the doorstep, letting the silence wash over me. It was so sudden, so complete, that it almost felt wrong. The world outside was perfectly still. No noise, no wind, no cars passing by. It was like the static had been everything, and now, without it, the world was too quiet. I hurried to my car, trying not to think too hard about it. I just needed to get somewhere, anywhere, that didn't feel like my mind was being invaded. As I got into the driver's seat and turned on the engine, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. A figure, standing at the edge of the street, half hidden in the shadows, under a tree. At first, I thought it was a trick of the light. Maybe a neighbor, or someone walking their dog, just barely out of view. But the figure didn't move. It just stood there, motionless, staring straight at me. It wasn't the way a person stands. People shift, people move, people breathe. This thing didn't do any of that. It was like it was waiting, and it was tall, way too tall to be a person. My heart was racing now, my fingers trembling as I fumbled with the gear shift. I pulled out of my parking spot, my eyes darting back to where the figure stood. It was gone. I didn't even see it move. One second it was there, and the next, nothing. I hit the gas and sped down the street every nerve in my body on high alert. I kept checking the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that figure appear again. But the road behind me stayed empty. No cars, no people, just the same eerie silence that had swallowed everything when I left the apartment. After about 15 minutes, I pulled into a gas station. It was one of those 24-hour places with flickering neon signs and a single car parked out front. I needed a break, just a second to breathe and think straight. As soon as I turned off the engine, my phone buzzed again. I yanked it out of my pocket, my heart pounding, dreading what I was about to see. It was Mark again. You can't outrun them. I threw the phone onto the passenger seat, my pulse racing. This wasn't just about some stupid website anymore. It felt like something was hunting me, something not human. I got out of the car and headed into the gas station, trying to act normal. The guy behind the counter barely looked up from his phone, and I was grateful for that. The last thing I needed was someone asking me why I looked like I'd seen a ghost. I grabbed a bottle of water and made my way to the back of the store figuring I'd take a minute to compose myself. But as I reached the drink coolers, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. A figure, just like before. This time, it was standing in the reflection of the cooler door, distorted and stretched, like it didn't belong in the space it was occupying. I spun around, hot in my throat, but there was no one there. I backed away slowly, eyes darting from the reflection to the empty aisle in front of me. My breathing was shallow, panic clawing at my chest. 
I didn't know what was real anymore. The static was gone, but the presence, the feeling, wasn't. I paid for the water and bolted out of there, back to my car, locking the doors as soon as I got inside. But the second I put the key in the ignition, my phone buzzed again. This time, it wasn't Mark. It was from an unknown number, and the message was just a single word. Look. The moment I read it, I felt that same cold dread wash over me. Slowly, almost against my will, I looked up. And there, standing just outside my car, inches from the passenger side window, was the figure. It was staring right at me. I froze. The figure was right there, just inches from the passenger window, its form distorted by the glass. It didn't look fully human, too tall, too thin, its limbs slightly elongated, stretching in ways that didn't make sense. But the worst part, the part that made my blood turn to ice, was its face, or rather, the lack of one. There were no eyes, no mouth, nothing. Just smooth, pale skin, where its face should have been, like it had been erased or never existed in the first place. And yet, somehow, I could feel it staring at me, not through sight, but through something else, like it was trying to peer directly into my mind. I wanted to scream. I wanted to throw the car into reverse and get the hell out of there, but my body wouldn't move. It was like I was stuck, paralyzed, my muscles locked in place. I could barely breathe. The figure didn't move either, just stood there, impossibly still. The only thing separating us, that thin sheet of glass. My phone buzzed again. I didn't want to look at it, but my eyes moved on their own, drawn to the screen like a magnet. Another message from the same unknown number. This one was even shorter. It's too late. Suddenly, the car door handle rattled. I jumped, my heart slamming into my chest. The figure was trying to get in. The handle shook again, more violently this time, as if it was testing the strength of the lock. I fumbled with the keys, my hands trembling, finally turning the ignition and slamming my foot onto the gas. The car lurched forward, tires screeching as I tore out of the gas station parking lot. I didn't look back. I didn't want to know if the figure was still standing there or if it was following me. I just drove. Faster and faster, my heart pounding in my ears, the world around me a blur. The empty streets of my town whipped by as I pushed the speedometer past what was safe. But I didn't care. I needed to get away. But no matter how far I drove, I couldn't escape the feeling that something was still watching me. After what felt like hours, I finally pulled into a desolate side road hidden between rows of trees, far away from any lights or people. My hands were shaking so badly that I had to pry them off the steering wheel. I parked the car, turned off the engine, and sat there in the dark, trying to calm my breathing. The only sound was my own shallow gasps and the faint ticking of the cooling engine. But the silence didn't last long. The static came back faint at first, almost like it was being carried on the wind, but it grew louder, filling the car with that same crackling buzz that had haunted me all day. I gripped the steering wheel, staring at the dark trees ahead of me, praying that the figure wouldn't appear again, but I knew it wasn't over. The phone buzzed again. I was shaking now, but I knew I couldn't ignore it. With trembling hands, I picked up the phone, dreading what I'd see this time. The message wasn't from Mark. It wasn't even from an unknown number. It was from me. You should have opened the door. I dropped the phone, like it burned me. How the hell was I texting myself? I didn't even have time to process it, because as soon as the phone hit the floor, the radio in my car 
despite being turned off, crackled to life. The static exploded through the speakers, loud enough to make my ears ring, and underneath it, those whispers returned. Dozens of voices, overlapping, speaking that strange broken language that was more like shapes than words. Then, through the static, a new sound, knocking, slow, deliberate knocking on the passenger side window. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't help it. My head turned, almost as if something was forcing me to. The figure was back, closer this time. Its featureless face was nearly pressed against the glass, its long fingers tapping rhythmically, trying to get in. I squeezed my eyes shut, my heart hammering in my chest. I couldn't stay here. I couldn't keep running either. I had no idea what to do, but sitting in this car wasn't an option anymore. I threw open the door and bolted into the trees. The night air was cold, but I barely felt it. I was running on pure adrenaline, the branches whipping against my face as I crashed through the underbrush. I didn't care where I was going, I just needed to get away. But as I ran, the static followed me, buzzing in the air, surrounding me, like the entire forest was alive with that same terrible sound. I don't know how long I ran. Time had lost all meaning. My lungs were burning, my legs felt like they were made of lead, but I couldn't stop. I didn't want to stop, not until I felt safe again. But that feeling never came. When I finally slowed down, I found myself in a small clearing. The trees loomed around me, tall and dark, and for a moment, I thought maybe I had lost it, whatever it was. The static had faded, and the only sound left was the distant rustle of the wind through the leaves. But then I felt it, that same oppressive presence, the one that had been watching me since I first clicked on that damn website. It was here, in the clearing, with me. I turned around slowly, my whole body trembling with dread. The figure stood at the edge of the clearing, motionless, its featureless face angled toward me. But it wasn't alone this time. Behind it, stretching into the darkness, were more figures, dozens of them, all tall, all thin, all lacking faces. They were standing perfectly still, like statues, but I could feel them. I could feel them watching me, surrounding me, and that's when I realized they had been there the whole time. The static was just a distraction, a way to cloud my mind, to keep me from seeing them until it was too late. They hadn't needed to chase me. They had just been waiting for me to come to them. The countdown, that damn countdown, it wasn't leading to some big event. It wasn't counting down to a moment when something would happen. It was counting down to this, to the moment when I'd have nowhere left to run when I'd be surrounded, when I'd be theirs. My phone buzzed one last time. I didn't want to look, but I knew I had to. The message was short, just two words. Open up. I stood there, frozen in that clearing, surrounded by those faceless figures. The static hummed low, almost like a heartbeat, pulsing through the air, vibrating in my skull. My phone slipped from my hand, and hit the ground with a soft thud, but I didn't move to pick it up. I couldn't. Every instinct I had was screaming at me to run, but there was nowhere left to go. The message echoed in my mind. Open up! The figures didn't move. They just stood there, waiting. I had no idea what they wanted, but I knew that whatever it was, it wasn't good. My breath came in shallow gasps as my mind raced, trying to piece together a plan, anything that could get me out of this. But there was no plan. I was trapped. The countdown, it was almost over. I hadn't checked it in hours, 
but I could feel it ticking down in my head, every second pulling me closer to something, but I still didn't know what. Something wanted me. That much was clear. The question was why. I felt a vibration at my feet, my phone buzzing again. My hand moved without thinking, like it wasn't mine anymore. Reaching down to pick it up, the screen flickered to life, and I saw it. The countdown. Zero, 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 zero. Fifteen seconds. I watched the numbers tick down, helpless. Ten seconds. Five. Three. As it hit zero, the phone screen went black, and the static exploded around me, louder than ever, like a hundred TVs, all tuned to dead channels, filling the clearing with that awful noise. I dropped the phone again and clamped my hands over my ears, but it didn't stop the sound. It was inside me now, rattling around in my brain like it was trying to break me open. The figures moved, slowly, deliberately. They stepped forward, surrounding me on all sides. Their movements were jerky, unnatural, like marionettes being pulled by invisible strings. They closed in, their faceless heads tilted toward me, and I could feel their presence pressing down on me, suffocating me with the weight of their gaze. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. My throat was tight, my mouth dry, and all I could do was watch as they drew closer and closer. Then one of them reached out, its hand, long thin fingers, pale and smooth like wax, stretched toward me. The moment it touched my arm, a cold shock rippled through my body, freezing me in place. The static grew louder, drilling into my skull, and the whispers returned, filling the space between the noise. You opened the door. It wasn't a whisper anymore. It was a voice. Clear. Calm. Terrifying. The figure's hand gripped my arm tighter and I felt my skin go numb where it touched me. My vision blurred, and the world around me started to dissolve, the trees fading into shadow, the ground shifting beneath my feet. The whispers grew louder, more urgent, overlapping until they were all I could hear. They weren't speaking in that strange, broken language anymore. They were speaking to me. You let us in. I fell to my knees, the cold from the figure's hand spreading through my body like ice water in my veins. My limbs were heavy, my mind foggy, and I could feel myself slipping away, sinking deeper into whatever they had planned for me. But then something changed. The static shifted, the tone of the whisper softened, and for the first time I could make out words, real words. It's not too late. The words cut through the noise, clear and sharp, as if coming from somewhere far away. I didn't understand. It had to be too late. The countdown had ended. They were here. The figures stopped moving, all of them freezing in place, their faceless heads tilting in unison, as if they had heard it too. The grip on my arm loosened just enough for me to yank myself free and I stumbled back, gasping for breath. You can still close the door. I looked around wildly, trying to find the source of the voice. But there was nothing. Just the figures, standing still, waiting. The static was quieter now, but the presence of the figures still hung heavy, in the air. The door. That's what they wanted. That's what all of this was about. I had opened it, maybe not a literal door, but something. I had let them in, and now I had to find a way to close it. I scrambled to my feet, backing away from the figures, my heart pounding in my chest. I had no idea how to close the door, or what that even meant, but I knew I had to try. The static buzzed around me, growing louder again, as the figures started to move. My phone. I needed my phone. I dropped to the ground and grabbed it, frantically swiping through the apps, 
trying to find anything that might help. The dark web link was gone, but there had to be something, some way to undo what I had done. Then I saw it, an icon glowing faintly at the bottom of the screen, a black circle, just like the one I'd seen on the original project doorway page. Without thinking, I tapped it. The screen went black for a moment, and my heart skipped a beat, fearing I had made everything worse. But then a new message appeared, written in the same strange geometric symbols that had haunted me from the start. But this time, there was a button beneath it. Close the door. I didn't hesitate. I tapped the button. The static erupted in a final deafening roar, and the figures lunged toward me, their jerky movements becoming frantic, desperate. But as they moved, they started to fade, their bodies dissolving into the air like smoke caught in a gust of wind. One by one, they disappeared, their faceless heads vanishing into the darkness until I was alone in the clearing. The static cut out, replaced by a silence so complete it was almost suffocating. I stood there, breathing heavily, the cold night air biting at my skin. The figures were gone, the countdown was over, the door was closed, but I wasn't sure if I was safe. I looked down at my phone one last time, half expecting another message to appear, but the screen was blank. Whatever I had tapped, whatever button I had pressed, it had worked. I was back, alone in the dark, but the weight of their presence still lingered, like a shadow that refused to fade. I didn't know if they were truly gone, or if they were just waiting for another door to open. I climbed into my car and drove home, in silence, the static finally gone, but the fear still clawing at the edges of my mind. And now, whenever I'm alone in the dark, I can't shake the feeling that they're still out there, waiting. I was hired through the dark web to erase someone from reality, but they're still here and they know what I did. All right, so I know this is going to sound crazy. I wouldn't believe it myself if it didn't happen to me. But uh, here I am typing this out because I need to get this off my chest before I lose my mind. Maybe someone out there can help me make sense of it. Or maybe this is just my way of warning you. Stay away from the dark web. It all started about a year ago. I was in a pretty dark place, between jobs, broke, and desperately looking for ways to make quick money. And when I say desperate, I mean desperate. I'd heard about the dark web before, mostly just rumors about creepy stuff, illegal drugs, hitmen, whatever. But I figured there had to be something out there that wasn't all crime related, right? Maybe some sketchy freelance work or whatever. So against my better judgment, I downloaded Tor and started poking around. It was mostly boring at first. Forums that looked like they hadn't been updated since 2005. Random online marketplaces selling everything from fake IDs to, well, things I won't mention. But eventually, I stumbled across a site called the Echo Agency. The description was vague. Something about services for those who seek resolution and a discreet way to remove obstacles. I thought it was a joke, but something about it felt professional. There was a contact form, and I don't know why, but I filled it out. It didn't ask for much. Just a name, didn't have to be real, an email, burner obviously, and a short description of the job you wanted done. I wasn't looking for anything illegal, just testing the waters, so I typed in something generic like looking for work, open to anything, discreet. I hit send and forgot about it. I didn't expect a response, but about a week later, I got an email. 
It wasn't like one of those shady, dark web messages filled with cryptic nonsense or or weird symbols. No, this was professional, simple, to the point. The subject line was, your services are required. The message itself was even stranger. You've been selected for a unique opportunity. We require your assistance in a delicate matter. Compensation will be generous and further details will be provided upon acceptance. There was no signature, no name, no nothing. Just a link to click if I was interested. Now, you'd think I'd just delete that and move on with my life. But like I said, I was desperate and something about it intrigued me. The promise of generous compensation hooked me. I clicked the link. It brought me to a private page with a list of tasks. All of them were vague, but one stood out. Erasure specialist. I had no idea what that meant, but it had the highest payout. Stupidly, I figured it was some kind of digital thing, like scrubbing someone's online presence, getting rid of data, that sort of thing. The payout was insane though. $50,000. I applied, and within minutes, I got another email with the details, but this time, the job description wasn't so vague. Target. Christopher R. Objective. Erasure. Compensation. $50,000 upon confirmation of success. There was a picture of this guy, Christopher R. He looked like your average dude. Late thirties, dark hair, glasses. Pretty unremarkable. Just some random guy, right? but the instructions made my stomach drop. They weren't asking me to delete his digital footprint or wipe his identity off the internet. Number. They were asking me to make him disappear from reality. Like, as if he never existed. Now, at this point, I should have noped out of there, but I didn't. The money, man. The money was too good. Plus, curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to know how this was even possible. Was this some kind of prank? Maybe a scam? So I replied, accepting the job. That's when things got really weird. A few hours later, a package arrived at my apartment. No return address, no shipping label, nothing. Just a plain black box. Inside was a single item, a small, old-fashioned tape recorder, and a note. Play the tape. Follow the instructions. Do not deviate. I remember just sitting there for a while, staring at the recorder. I hadn't used one of these things since high school, but it wasn't like I had much choice at this point. I pressed play. The voice on the tape was distorted, but still oddly clear. It sounded like someone was speaking through a layer of static. If you are listening to this, You have accepted the job. Good. You have been chosen for your discretion and reliability. You must locate the target, Christopher R., and perform the erasure ritual. A ritual? This was starting to sound like some cult stuff. I wanted to laugh, but the voice continued. The ritual requires three steps. First, retrieve an object that belongs to the target. Second, Recite the incantation included in this package. Finally, light the black candle and leave the area immediately. Do not look back. Do not speak to anyone for 24 hours. I paused the tape. This had to be a joke, right? But when I looked in the box again, underneath the recorder, there was a small black candle and a sheet of paper with strange symbols and words I couldn't understand. Something cold crept up my spine, but I was in too deep now. I needed that money, and if all I had to do was follow some weird instructions, and this guy would, I don't know, disappear or something, I could handle it. At least that's what I thought. I wish I could go back and change my mind, because Christopher R. didn't disappear. In fact, He's more present now than ever. 
and he knows what I did. After I got the package, things started to feel off. It wasn't like I was suddenly spooked or paranoid, but there was this nagging feeling in the back of my mind that something wasn't right. Still, I had already accepted the job, and backing out wasn't an option, not with fifty grand on the line. I told myself it was just some elaborate roleplay thing, like maybe this guy was a weirdo who paid people to do creepy, ritualistic stuff for kicks. I didn't care, as long as the money came through. So I started doing my homework on Christopher R. I had no information except for the photo I was sent. No address, no phone number, nothing. The rational part of me thought I'd end up spending days or weeks trying to track this guy down. But here's the thing. I found him almost immediately. I uploaded the picture to a reverse image search. And guess what? The guy had a LinkedIn profile, a Twitter account, and a Facebook page. He wasn't some ghost. He was a real person with a normal life. According to his profiles, he lived about two hours away from me, in some sleepy suburban neighborhood. Everything about him seemed painfully average. He was a software engineer, married, no kids, worked from home. There were a couple of pictures of him and his wife, both smiling, looking happy. I stared at the screen for a while, trying to wrap my head around why someone would want this guy gone. Was he involved in something shady? Did he piss off the wrong people? I had no idea, and frankly, I didn't care. I wasn't being paid to ask questions. I just needed to do the job and get out. But it wasn't that simple. I spent the next few days driving by his neighborhood, scoping things out. I figured the easiest way to get an object of his, like the instructions said, would be to break into his house, but I didn't exactly have a lot of experience with that. Plus, the whole thing made me uneasy. It wasn't the idea of stealing that bothered me. It was this overwhelming sense that I was getting involved in something far more dangerous than I realized. Eventually, I decided to play it safe. There was a coffee shop in town that he seemed to frequent based on his social media posts. I figured I'd wait for him to show up, grab something he left behind, maybe a jacket or a pair of sunglasses or something. It felt cleaner than breaking into his house. I waited for hours that day, and just when I was about to give up, there he was, Christopher R. in the flesh. It was weird seeing him in real life. He looked exactly like his photos like some guy you'd pass on the street without giving a second thought. I watched him from across the shop as he ordered coffee, sat down with his laptop, and went to work. It was surreal knowing what I was about to do. He had no idea that someone in that very room had been hired to make him disappear. My heart was racing, but I stayed calm. I needed to play it cool. About an hour later, Christopher packed up his stuff and left, leaving behind a small black leather notebook on the table. I didn't think twice. As soon as he walked out the door, I grabbed the notebook and slipped it into my bag. My hands were shaking, but I forced myself to stay composed. I could feel eyes on me, like someone had seen what I did, but when I glanced around the coffee shop, no one was paying attention. I got out of there fast, though. Back at home, I pulled the notebook out of my bag and stared at it for a long time. It was a simple, unassuming thing, but something about it felt heavy, like it carried more weight than it should have. I flipped through the pages, but they were mostly filled with random notes, technical sketches, a few to-do lists, nothing out of the ordinary. It was personal, sure, but not incriminating. This was it. This was the object I needed for the ritual. I lit the black candle from the package and set the notebook in front of me. 
The symbols on the paper stared back at me, mocking me with their strangeness. I tried to convince myself that this was all just some weird game, but there was this sinking feeling in my gut, this creeping sense that something terrible was about to happen. I grabbed the sheet of paper with the incantation and read it aloud, mm. even though the words felt like sand in my mouth. They weren't in any language I'd ever heard, just a string of harsh, guttural sounds that made the air feel thick and heavy. The room felt colder as I spoke, like someone had opened a window, but I was alone, completely alone. When I finished, I blew out the candle. The instruction said I needed to leave the area immediately, so I grabbed my stuff and left my apartment without a second thought. I didn't even bother locking the door. I just got out. I spent the night at a motel on the other side of town, staring at the ceiling and waiting for something to happen. The instructions were clear. Do not speak to anyone for 24 hours. Do not look back. But nothing happened. Not that night, at least. I tried to sleep, but my mind was racing my skin crawling with unease. When the 24 hours were up, I went home, expecting, I don't know, something. Maybe I thought Christopher would vanish into thin air, or I'd get some confirmation that the job was done. But there was nothing. No email. No message. Nothing had changed. I convinced myself it was over. I did what they asked, right? I followed the instructions. I figured I'd get paid soon enough. But that night, I saw him. Christopher R. was standing outside my window. I live on the third floor. He was just standing there, on the sidewalk, looking up at my apartment. No expression on his face. Just staring. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, thinking maybe I was just tired, seeing things. But when I looked again, he was still there, watching me. I slammed the blind shut and backed away from the window, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to call someone, anyone, but the words from the tape echoed in my mind. Do not speak to anyone for 24 hours. I had followed the rules. I'd done everything right. So why was he still here? And how the hell did he know where I lived. I didn't sleep that night. How could I? I sat in the corner of my room, as far from the window as possible, my heart pounding in my ears. Every little sound made me jump. The creak of the floorboards, the distant hum of traffic, it all felt louder, sharper, like the world had suddenly become hostile. I kept replaying the image of Christopher R standing on the sidewalk, staring up at me, over and over in my head. I wanted to call the cops. I mean, what else do you do when someone's creeping outside your apartment in the middle of the night? But then I remembered the job. Who was I supposed to tell? Hey, officer, I took a contract to erase someone from reality, and now he's standing outside my window, even though he's not supposed to exist anymore. Yeah, that'd go over well, so I just waited. Hours passed, the darkness outside, slowly turning to the grey light of dawn. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. I forced myself to creep over to the window, heart in my throat, and peeked through the blinds. He was gone, but that didn't make me feel any better. If anything, the emptiness outside felt worse. Where the hell did he go? How did he even get there in the first place? And why was he watching me? I spent the day pacing around my apartment, checking my phone constantly, expecting some kind of update from the Echo Agency. But there was nothing. No email, no message, no payout. My head was spinning. What if the job hadn't worked? What if I screwed something up? I tried to go about my day like normal, but I couldn't shake the feeling 
that I was being watched. Every time I left my apartment, I caught myself glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see Christopher lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing. By the time evening rolled around, I was a nervous wreck. I kept telling myself that maybe I imagined it. Maybe I was just so freaked out by the whole thing that my mind was playing tricks on me. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. Around 8 p.m., I got an email. Payment will be issued upon confirmation of completion. We are monitoring your progress. That was it. No explanation. No details. I stared at the screen, my hands trembling. Monitoring my progress? What the hell did that mean? How were they monitoring me? Were they watching me too? I needed air. I grabbed my jacket and decided to go for a walk. Maybe clearing my head would help. As I stepped outside, the cool night air hit me, and for a moment, I almost felt normal again. I told myself that I was just being paranoid, that the job was done, and that I was overthinking things. But then I saw him again. Christopher, standing at the end of the block under a street light. Just standing there, like he was waiting for me. He wasn't looking at me this time. He was just staring straight ahead, motionless, like a statue. My blood ran cold. I wanted to run back inside, lock the door, and never come out again. But something stopped me. I had to know. I had to know if this was real. So I did something incredibly stupid. I walked toward him. The closer I got, the more I realized something was off. His clothes were the same as they had been the last time I saw him, like he hadn't changed or done anything in days. His skin looked pale, too pale, like all the color had drained out of him, but it was his eyes that really got me. They were wide open, unblinking, glossy, dead. I stopped about ten feet away from him, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst out of my chest. I opened my mouth to say something, but no words came out. What could I possibly say to him? Before I could decide, he moved, slowly, just his head, turning to face me. His eyes locked onto mine, and for the first time, I saw something flicker behind them. Something dark, something wrong. He didn't speak, he just looked at me, like he was waiting for me to do something like he knew. Suddenly, I realized I didn't want to be anywhere near him. I backed up, heart racing, my hands shaking. He didn't follow me. He didn't even move. He just kept staring, his head slightly tilted, like he was confused or curious. I turned and bolted back to my apartment, my footsteps echoing through the empty streets. I slammed the door behind me, locked it, and collapsed onto the floor, trying to catch my breath. What the hell was happening? How was he still here? The ritual was supposed to erase him, but if anything, it seemed like I'd done the opposite. I'd brought him closer. For the rest of the night, I stayed inside, my eyes glued to the door. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was out there, waiting for me. I kept checking my phone, hoping for some kind of message from the Echo Agency, some explanation, but there was nothing. I was on my own. Around 2 a.m., I heard it. A knock. It wasn't loud, just a soft, gentle tapping on my door, like someone politely asking to come in. I froze. My brain immediately screamed, Don't answer it! But my body was already moving. My feet shuffled toward the door my hand reaching for the knob before I could stop myself. The air around me felt heavy, like I was moving underwater. I pressed my ear to the door, holding my breath, listening. Another knock. Louder this time. I squeezed my eyes shut, praying that whoever, whatever was on the other side, would just go away. But then, through the door, I heard it. A voice, whispering, hoarse. 
like it hadn't been used in years. You didn't finish the job. My heart stopped. I stumbled back from the door, my body trembling. The voice wasn't angry. It wasn't even loud. It was calm, almost amused. You can't make me disappear. I wanted to scream. I wanted to run. But all I could do was stand there, frozen in place, as the voice spoke again. I'm still here. And now, I know where you live. The knocking stopped. Silence. I didn't sleep. I didn't even move. I sat there staring at the door, waiting for something else to happen. But the rest of the night passed in agonizing stillness. By the time the sun came up, I felt like I was going insane. I needed to get out of there. I packed a bag and left, not knowing where I was going, just knowing I couldn't stay in that apartment any longer. But as I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone, because in the rearview mirror, I saw him again, Christopher R., standing at the end of the street, watching. I didn't know where to go. I just drove, farther and farther away from my apartment, from that place where I'd heard his voice through the door. The city streets blurred into empty highways, and eventually those became winding back roads. I kept looking in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see Christopher standing in the middle of the road, but he wasn't there. Still, the feeling of being watched lingered, like a weight pressing down on my chest. It didn't matter how far I went. I couldn't escape it. I ended up in this small, run-down motel, about two towns over, the kind of place where no one asks questions. The neon sign outside buzzed and flickered, half the letters burnt out. The guy at the front desk barely looked up from his TV when I paid for the room in cash. Once I was inside, I locked the door, bolted it, and shoved a chair under the handle, just for good measure. The room smelled like stale cigarettes and old carpet, but I didn't care. I just needed somewhere to hide, somewhere that felt safe, even though I knew deep down that safety was an illusion. Not anymore. I collapsed onto the bed, staring at the cracked ceiling, my mind racing. How had this all gone so wrong? I was supposed to make this guy disappear, not turn him into some kind of nightmare that wouldn't leave me alone. I kept thinking about the ritual. Had I done something wrong, skipped a step, mispronounced the incantation? It didn't make sense. None of it made sense. And that was the worst part. I had no idea what I was dealing with. As the night wore on, I became painfully aware of the silence in the room. It was thick, oppressive, broken only by the occasional hum of a car passing by outside. I tried turning on the TV to drown out my thoughts, but the static was even worse. I flipped through the channels, but every single one was just static. White noise, no shows, no news, nothing, just empty. The clock on the wall ticked loudly, each second dragging on longer than the last. I knew I wasn't going to sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I could see Christopher's face, those wide, glossy eyes staring at me, empty and cold. I was lying there, in that haze between waking and sleeping, when I heard it again. A knock, not at the door. Number. This time, it was coming from the window, the second floor window. My blood turned to ice. I stayed perfectly still, barely daring to breathe. The knock came again, soft but deliberate, like someone was tapping just to let me know they were there. I turned my head slowly toward the window. The curtains were drawn, but I could see the faint outline of a figure on the other side. It was him. It had to be. Christopher, how the hell did he find me? How was he even there at the window two floors up? None of it made any sense, but none of that mattered because he was right outside, just a thin piece of glass between us. 
I clenched my hands into fists, nails digging into my palms, trying to keep myself from shaking. My mind screamed at me to do something, run, hide, anything, but I was frozen, completely paralyzed. The knocking stopped. For a moment, everything went silent again. I waited, praying that maybe he was gone. Maybe I was imagining things. Maybe. Then the whisper came. Let me in. The voice was muffled, but I could hear it through the glass, clear enough to send a wave of nausea through me. I squeezed my eyes shut, hoping that if I ignored it, maybe it would stop. But the voice came again, louder this time. You didn't finish the job. My breath hitched. It was the same phrase he'd said before. The same calm, patient tone. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. My throat felt tight, like something was choking me from the inside. I stayed that way for what felt like hours, curled up on the bed, shaking, waiting for something, anything to happen, but nothing did. The voice went silent, the knocking stopped. Eventually, I worked up the courage to peek through the curtains. The window was empty. No one was there, but I knew better than to feel relief. The next morning, I checked out of the motel and kept driving. No destination in mind. I just had to keep moving. There was no pattern to it, no logic. I couldn't risk staying in one place too long, not with him tracking me, watching me. Every time I stopped for gas or food, I'd catch glimpses of him, just out of the corner of my eye, standing in a parking lot, watching from across the street, always distant, always watching. At one point, I thought I saw him in the reflection of the gas station's bathroom mirror. I blinked, and he was gone, but the feeling lingered, the sense that he was getting closer, closing in on me. I drove for days, barely sleeping, barely eating. I tried to contact the Echo Agency, but their site was gone. The email address bounced back. It was like they'd never existed. I even tried looking them up online, digging through forums and message boards, but nothing, no trace of them. It was like I'd imagined the whole thing, but I knew I hadn't. Christopher R. was real. He was out there, following me, waiting. By the time I hit the fifth or sixth town, I couldn't take it anymore. I was exhausted, out of money, and out of options. My mind was unraveling, paranoia gnawing at my thoughts like a disease. I couldn't outrun him forever. That's when I got desperate. Desperate enough to do something I never thought I'd do. I went back to the dark web. I had to. I needed answers, needed someone, anyone, to tell me what the hell was going on. I didn't even care about the money anymore. I just wanted it to stop. I wanted to make him go away, for real this time. It took me hours of searching, diving deeper into the parts of the internet that no sane person should ever see. But eventually, I found something, a forum, buried deep, filled with stories that sounded eerily similar to mine. People talking about contracts, erasures, things coming back. The posts were scattered, vague, but they all hinted at the same thing. Whatever I had done, it hadn't worked. And worse, it had somehow tethered me to him. Instead of erasing Christopher, I had bound him to me. Now, he was stuck, half in this world, half out of it, and I was the one who'd brought him here. The last post I found chilled me to the core. Once you let them in, they never leave. I slammed the laptop shut and threw it across the room, my hands shaking. Let them in? I hadn't let anyone in. I hadn't opened the door or the window. I hadn't even spoken to him. But the words kept echoing in my head. Let me in. I had heard that voice twice now. And both times, I had ignored it. 
But what if that was the mistake? What if, by refusing, I had made things worse? What if the only way to end this was to let him in? I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to accept that the only way to stop this nightmare was to face it head on, to let him in. The very idea of it twisted my stomach into knots, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized I had no other choice. Every road had led me here, to this awful conclusion. I spent the next few days going through the motions, knowing it was just a matter of time before he found me again. There was no running anymore, no hiding. I'd seen Christopher everywhere, always in the distance, always watching. He wasn't following me in the normal sense. No, this was something far worse. It was like he was always there, waiting just out of sight, waiting for me to make the final move. I started to wonder if he was in my head, if he had always been that maybe this whole thing was some kind of elaborate hallucination. But then I'd catch him in those fleeting moments, those horrifying glimpses when I knew, deep down, he was real. The only thing more terrifying than the thought of him being some figment of my mind was the fact that he existed, truly existed. And now, I had to let him in. I drove back to the same motel, the same room, the second floor room where he had first knocked on my window. I couldn't explain why I returned there, but it felt right, like that's where it was all supposed to end, where it had to end. The moment I stepped inside, a chill crawled up my spine. It was like the room had been waiting for me. The chair was still under the door handle. The air still smelled like stale cigarettes and the buzzing neon light outside the window flickered in its same, broken pattern. Nothing had changed. I sat on the edge of the bed, staring at the window, waiting for nightfall. The minutes dragged by, each one heavier than the last. My breath grew shallow, heart racing as the sun dipped below the horizon, leaving me alone in the dark. I didn't need to see the clock to know it was almost time. Sure enough, just as the sky turned black, I heard it. The knock. Software polite. Like the last time. Like he was asking for permission. My entire body froze. Every instinct screamed at me to stay silent. To pretend I wasn't there. To hide under the bed. To leave the room. To run. But I didn't. This time I stood up. My legs were shaky, like they weren't even mine. Slowly, I walked toward the window. Every step felt like it took an eternity. I reached out, my hand trembling, and pulled the curtains back. There he was, Christopher R., standing just outside the second floor window, suspended in the air as if the ground meant nothing to him. His face was exactly as I remembered it but worse. His skin was paler now, almost translucent, and his eyes, they were wide, unblinking, staring directly at me. There was no humanity left in them, just an endless empty void, and yet I couldn't look away. He didn't speak at first. He just stood there, watching me, as if waiting for me to make the next move. I placed my hand on the glass cold as ice beneath my fingers, and for the first time in days, I spoke. What do you want? My voice was barely a whisper, but it was enough. I didn't expect him to answer. I didn't expect anything at all, but he smiled. A slow, twisted smile that sent a jolt of fear through me. It was the kind of smile that said he knew something I didn't, that he had all the time in the world. Then he spoke, the same words he had whispered through my door before. Let me in. The air in the room felt heavy, like the walls were closing in on me. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared at him, his pale face inches away from mine, 
separated only by a thin pane of glass. I knew what I had to do. I didn't want to do it, but there was no other way. With a shaking hand, I unlocked the window. The moment the latch clicked, everything changed. The room felt colder, like a blast of icy wind had rushed inside. I pushed the window open, the hinges creaking in protest. I didn't move. I just stood there, my breath coming in shallow gasps. Christopher stepped forward, crossing the threshold between outside and in. His movements were slow, deliberate, like he had all the time in the world. The smile never left his face. The moment he entered the room, the lights flickered. The air felt wrong, like it was pressing down on me, suffocating me. I couldn't breathe, couldn't think. He was inside now. He stood just a few feet from me, his eyes locked onto mine, and for the first time, I saw it. The truth. The horror of what I'd done. The ritual wasn't about erasing him from existence. It was about bringing him closer. Closer to me. I had tethered him to this world, and now there was no undoing it. He leaned in, his cold breath brushing against my skin. You finished the job. I couldn't move. Couldn't speak. All I could do was stand there, trembling as his eyes bore into mine. Then, just as quickly as it began, he was gone. No flash of light, no dramatic exit. He simply vanished. One second he was there, and the next the room was empty. The air felt lighter, warmer. The oppressive feeling was gone. I stood there for a long time, trying to wrap my head around what had just happened. Was it over? Was that it? Had I finally finished the job? I wanted to believe it, but deep down, I knew it wasn't that simple. Christopher R. wasn't gone. Not really. He had left, but I could still feel him. Somewhere. Out there. Lurking just beyond the edge of my reality. I left the motel that night, drove back home, and waited. Days passed. Then weeks. Life went on. Almost like normal. Almost. But I never forgot. I never stopped feeling like I was being watched. And sometimes, in the dead of night, I hear it again. The knock, soft word gentle, and a voice, just outside the window, whispering the same thing over and over. Let me in. I don't know how long this will last. Maybe he'll come back for good one day. Maybe I'll let him in again. Or maybe I won't have a choice. But I do know one thing. Once you let him in, he never really leaves.